In this video, I'd like to tell you how to write control statements for your Octave programs. So things like for, while, and if statements, and uh, also how to define and use functions. Here's my Octave window. Let me first show you how to use a for loop. I'm going to start by setting v to be a 10 by 1 vector of zeros. Now, here's how I write a for loop. For i equals 1 to 10, that's uh, for i equals 1 colon 10, and um, let's see. I'm going to set v of i equals 2 to the power of i, and finally, end. Um, the white space doesn't matter, so I'm, I'm putting the spaces just to make it look nicely indented, but you know the spacing doesn't matter. But if I do this, then the result is that uh, v gets set to you know, 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2, and so on. So this is syntax for i equals 1 colon 10 that uh, makes i loop through the, the, the values 1 through 10. And by the way, you can also do this um, by setting your indices equals 1 to 10. And uh, let's look at indices. This is an array from 1 to 10. You can also write for i equals indices. Um, and this is actually the same as for i equals 1 through 10. You can do you know, display i and, and this will do the same thing. So that was a for loop. If you're familiar with um, break and continue, that's break and continue statements, you can also use those inside loops in Octave. But first, let me show you how a while loop works. So here's uh, my vector v. Let's write a while loop. i equals 1. While i is less than or equal to 5, let's set v i equals 100 and uh, increment i by 1. And so this says, uh, what, i starts off equal to 1, and then uh, I'm going to set vi equals 100, then increment i by 1 until i is you know, uh, greater than 5. And as a result of that, whereas previously v was this powers of 2 vector, I've now taken the first 5 elements of um, uh, my vector and overwritten them with this value 100. So that's the syntax for a while loop. Let's do another example. Um, I equals 1 while true. And here I want to show you how to use a break statement. Let's set v i equals 999 and uh, i equals i plus 1. If i equals 6, break and end. And this is also our first use of an if statement. Um, so I hope the logic of this makes sense. It says for i equals <coughs> i equals one, and you know infinite loop, while uh, repeatedly set v i equals one and increment i by one, and then once i gets up to six, do a break, which breaks you out of the while loop. And so the effect of this should be to take the first five elements of this vector v and set them to nine nine nine. And uh, yes, indeed, we've taken v and overwritten the first five elements with nine nine nine. So this is the syntax for if statement and for a while statement. And notice the uh, end, the, uh, we have two ends here. This end here ends the if statement, and the second end here ends the while statement. Now let me show you the more general syntax for how to use the if else uh, statement. So let's see, v1 is equal to 999. Um, let's set v1 equals to 2 for this example. So let me type if v1 equals 1, display the value is 1. Here's how you write an else statement, or rather here's an else if v1 equals 2. This is going to be the tr case that's true in our example. Display the value is 2, else display the value is not 1 or 2. Okay, so that's a uh, if, else if, else <coughs> statement hit end. And of course, here we've just set v1 equals 2, so hopefully, yep, it displays that the value is 2. And uh, finally, I, I don't think I talked about this earlier, but if you ever need to exit Octave, you can type the exit command and you hit enter. That will cause Octave to quit, or the Q quit command also works. Finally, let's talk about functions and how to define them and how to use them. Here's my desktop, and I have predefined a file, or pre-saved on my desktop, a file called squaredisnumber.m. 
this is how you define functions in Octave. Uh, you create a file called, you know, with your function name and then ending in .m. And when Octave finds this file, it knows that uh, this is where it should look for the definition of the function square this number .m. Let's open up this file. Notice that um, I'm using the Microsoft program WordPad to open up this file. I just want to encourage you if you're using Microsoft to uh, Microsoft Windows to use WordPad rather than Notepad to open up uh, uh, these files. If you have a different text editor, that's fine too, but Notepad sometimes messes up the spacing. Um, if you only have Notepad, that should work too, that could work too, but uh, if you have WordPad as well, I would, I would rather use that or some other text editor if you have a different text editor for editing your functions. So here's how you define a function in Octave. Let me just zoom in a little bit. And uh, this file has just three lines in it. The first line says function y equals square this number x. This tells Octave that I'm going to return a value y. Um, and I'm going to return one value and that that value is going to be saved in the variable y. And moreover, it tells Octave that this function has one argument, which is the argument x. And um, uh, the way the function body is defined is y equals x squared. So let's try to call this function square this number five. And um, this actually isn't going to work. And Octave says square this number is undefined. That's because Octave doesn't know where to find the find this file. So as usual, let's use pwd. Oh, I'm not in the right directory. So let's cd users ang slash desktop. That's where my desktop is. Um, oops, a little typo there. Users ang desktop. And if I now type square this number 5, it returns the answer 25. As kind of an advanced feature, this is only for those of you that know what the term ser search path means. But um, So if you want to modify the octave search path, and you could th just think of this next part as a advanced or optional material, only for those of you that are familiar with the concept of search paths in programming languages. But um, you can use the term add path, say c colon slash users slash ang slash desktop. <coughs> to add that directory to the octave search path so that even if I you know, go to some other directory, I can still, uh, octave still knows to look in the users ang desktop directory for functions so that even though I'm in a different directory now, it still knows where to find the square this number function. Okay, but uh, if, if, if you're not familiar with the concept of search paths, don't worry about it. Just make sure to use the cd command to go to the directory with your function before you run it and that should work just fine. One concept that Octave has that uh, many other programming languages don't is that it can also define, let you define functions that return multiple values or multiple arguments. So here's an example of that. I've defined a function called square and cube this number x. And what this says is this, this function returns two values, y1 and y2. I'm going to set them as follows. y1 is squared, y2 is x cubed. And what this does is this really returns you know, two numbers. So, so some of you, depending on what programming language you use, if you're familiar with you know, C, C++, Java, often we think of a function as returning just one value, but this all the syntax in Octave lets it return multiple values. Now back in the Octave window, if I type um, you know, A, B equals square and cube this number, five, then a is now equal to 25, and b is equal to the cube of five, is equal to 125. So this is um, often convenient if you need to define a function that returns multiple values. Finally, I'm going to show you just one more sophisticated example of a function. Let's say I have a data set that looks like this with data points at 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. And um, what I'd like to do is to define an octave function to compute the cost function j of theta for different values of theta. First, let's put the data into octave. So design, put, set my design matrix to be 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. So this is uh, my design matrix x with x0, the first column being the intercept term, and the second term being my, you know, the x values of my three training examples. And let me set y to be 1, 2, 3, as follows, which were the y-axis values. So <clears throat> let's say theta is equal to 0, semicolon, 1. Here on my desktop, I've predefined this cost function j. And uh, if I bring up the definition of that function, it looks as follows. So function j equals cost function j inputs x, y, theta. 
some comments specifying the inputs, uh, and then via a few steps, set M to be the number of training examples. That's the number of rows in X. Compute the predictions. Predictions equals X times theta. And uh, oh, this is a com comment that's wrapped around. So this is part of the preceding comment line. Compute the squared errors by you know, taking the difference between predictions and the Y values and taking element Y squaring. And then finally, computing the cost function J. And Octave knows that J is the value I, I want to return because J appeared here in the function definition. Feel free, by the way, <coughs> to uh, pause this um, video if you want to look at this function definition for longer and kind of make sure that you understand, is, uh, understand this, the different steps. But when I run it in Octave, I run J equals cost function J x, y, theta. It computes. Oops, made a typo there. Should have been capital X. It computes J equals zero because um, if my data set was, you know, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, then setting right theta zero equals zero, theta one equals one, this gives me exactly the forty-five degree line that fits my data set perfectly. Whereas in contrast, if I set theta equals say zero zero then this hypothesis uh, is predicting zeros on everything. This is saying theta 0 equals 0, theta 1 equals 0, and I compute the cost function, then it's uh, 2.333. And that's actually equal to 1 squared, which is my squared error on the first example, plus 2 squared, plus 3 squared, and then uh, divided by 2m, which is 2 times number of training examples, which is, oops, which is indeed 2.33. And so that sanity checks that um, this function here is, you know, computing the correct cost function, at least in the couple of examples we tried out on, on our simple training example. And so that sanity checks that uh, the cost function j, as, as defined here, that it is indeed, you know, seeming to uh, compute the correct cost function, at least on our simple training set that we had here with um, x and y. Uh, being the this, this simple training example that we saw. So now you know how to write control statements like for loops, while loops, and if statements in Octave, as well as how to define and use functions. In the next video, I'm going to just very quickly step you through the uh, logistics of working on and submitting problem sets uh, for this class, and um, how to use our submission system. And finally, after that, in the final uh, Octave tutorial video, I want to tell you about vectorization, which is an idea for how to uh, make your Octave programs run much faster.